only going to tell you the story once. Pass it around, alter it if you'd like. But once I'm done with the story, I want nothing more to do with it. Reliving the experience is bad enough, and I'm not going to do it twice. <sighs> not long after my 10th birthday, my parents shipped me off to Shroon Lake in upstate New York, where my auntie and uncle lived with their son Harry. My parents said it would be a good chance to reconnect. I hadn't seen any of them since I was four. As a child, I accepted the reasoning. In hindsight, I think my parents wanted a romantic week to themselves. Also, Harry was an antisocial boy in desperate need of friends like me. Although their house was small, the dense forest stretched for miles in every direction. What a lonely life, I remember thinking. Not a single neighbor in sight, only tall oaks and bristled pines as far as the eye could see. My parents said their hellos to my aunt and uncle, and then they said their goodbyes to me. Harry was nowhere to be seen. After showing me to the room I would share with Harry, Auntie left to cook dinner. While I set my stuff down on the bottom bunk of the bunk bed, Uncle stuck around to make small talk. He asked me if I was sad that summer vacation was nearly over. Like any sane child, I said that I was. He asked me about my grades, and then with a great smile told me how Harry was the brightest student in his class. Of course, Harry's class numbered just 40, whereas mine hovered around 400 people. But what did I know about Harry? Last I saw him, I was a toddler and Harry was in diapers. Couldn't even tell you what he looked like. Where is Harry? I asked. My uncle's smile faltered. Oh, he's, he's out playing. Harry spends all day in the forest. So long as he comes home for dinner, we can't complain. But I could tell by the drop in his tone, he wished Harry would spend his time hanging out with friends like any normal kid his age. As I learned, Harry came home like clockwork, always just in time for dinner. Just as Auntie took the pot roast out of the oven, the back door creaked open and Harry shuffled in. He was a short, skinny kid with long, floppy hair and purple rings under his eyes. He glanced at me, but said nothing. He was clear I didn't interest him in the slightest. Honey, this is your cousin Andrew, Auntie said. Harry muttered a hello. Maybe you can show him around the forest tomorrow. Take him with you on one of your adventures. Mom, I'm not supposed to. She flashed a harsh look. Harry shoved a piece of pot roast in his mouth before muttering, Fine. He said nothing more for the entire dinner. Auntie and Uncle asked me what I did earlier in the summer what I wanted to be when I grew up, and so on. I told them that I wanted to go to the Jersey Shore and that I wanted to be a zookeeper. To be polite, I asked Harry about himself, but Uncle answered for him, as if he wasn't there. Harry went to an art camp, he said. He wants to be an artist. When he's not exploring the forest, he's doodling in his sketchbook. Harry didn't look up from his food. When we finished eating, Harry fetched his sketchbook and sat down on the couch. Auntie passed out slices of apple pie, still warm from the oven. Until the end of the night, we chowed down and watched TV. Except for his drawing hand, Harry kept still and silent like another piece of furniture. I tried to peek at what he was drawing, but he angled the sketchbook away from me whenever I came close. What are you drawing? I asked. He didn't answer. I decided to look at the drawings later that night, when Harry showered before bed, but he took the book with him into the bathroom. Finally, when he laid down to sleep, I thought Harry might separate from the book, but he tucked the book under his pillow and fell asleep. So I gave up and went to bed. The bed was so stiff, I would have felt better sleeping on the floor. Regardless, it wasn't the bed that kept me awake. It was Harry's feverish mumblings. I haven't the slightest idea what he was saying. To Samukai Tumailo Moena Mekarso. It sounded like utter nonsense to me. A completely different language, harsh and guttural. Of course, I didn't think anything of it. I just wanted to sleep. The next day, Harry took me into the forest. The trees loomed high over us, and the thick canopy of leaves drowned the woods in twilight. The dirt trails wove through the area like veins on a giant earthen body, 
but they were not smooth, clean-cut trails. They were rough, bumpy paths carved out of the forest from frequent use. Where, where are we going? I asked Harry. I need to meet my friends, he said. Then as an afterthought, he said, Mom wants me to show you the lake first. Harry took me along one of the many paths, and I could tell he hadn't taken this, hat, this path in a while. The grass had started to creep up from the path's edges, and only the footprints were those of small woodland creatures. Sunlight streamed down on us in brilliant gold rays as, tr as the tree cover broke. Shroom Lake expanded before us, its surface as slick and shiny as a mirror's edge. I immediately took off my shirt and jumped into the cool, calm water. Harry stood on the sandy shore. Wait here. I'll be back. Before I could ask where he was going or when he'd be back, Harry had disappeared into the forest. Since I didn't know the way back home, I just had to wait. I swam until my limbs shivered from the cold water. Then I lay out in the hot sun until sweat dripped down my forehead. Then I waded out into the lake and stared at the line of trees bordering the water. Half an hour passed, and still Harry hadn't returned. Sighing, I hit the water and cursed my parents for sending me to my weirdo family in the first place. From miles off, a low rumble broke through the trees. Tall oaks bent and shuddered and shed their leaves. Birds crowed and shot into the sky in great flocks. As the sound rolled across the lake, it resonated in my bones. And suddenly I came gripped by fear. Harry! Harry! He didn't answer. I fled the lake and redressed. For another half hour, I paced back and forth, waiting either for Harry or whatever made that massive roar. <laughs> Although I couldn't say how I knew, I was certain something ancient had made that noise, something beyond the history or understanding of men. When Harry returned, sweat soaked the collar of his shirt and a splatter of blood stained his right sleeve. As always, his demeanor was calm. Let's go, he said. It's time for dinner. Uh, Harry, did you did you hear that? I did. What was that? What happened? Where, where did it go? Where did you go? I was with my friends, he said. We returned home along one of the many paths. But what was that noise, Harry? What was that? He wouldn't answer. I asked him many times. I asked him more questions, but he wouldn't answer any of them. When we reached the door to his house, Harry stopped. Don't say anything to my parents, he said. It seemed outrageous to ignore what I heard, but Harry's parents wouldn't believe me if I told them. Worse, perhaps they already knew and didn't want to talk about it. That evening, we ate dinner and watched more TV and finished off Auntie's pie. Harry spent the night scribbling in his sketchbook. As always, he guarded the contents of the book closely, even when he slept. Again, Harry interrupted my sleep with his nonsensical muttering. It was connected to the noise that I heard. I knew it. Regardless, I couldn't make any sense of it, and as soon as I fell asleep from exhaustion, I, I felt... I was confused. The next day followed the same pattern as before. Harry guided me through the forest, and then he left me behind at the lake. Half an hour later, a loud bellow shot through the woods. Half an hour after that, Harry returned to guide me home, just in time for dinner. It was an unspoken schedule that we followed religiously. However, on the fourth night, Harry left his sketchbook on top of his bed. I was a guest in his home, so I knew I should have allowed him his privacy. But naturally, I couldn't contain my curiosity. As soon as I heard the shower turn on, I opened the sketchbook. The first few pages depicted animals picked apart and tortured, limbs impaled, skin flayed, muscles bare, bones cracked. The body parts were rendered with vivid details. Someone only could imagine if they had seen it themselves. I flipped through the pages as quick as I could, long before I realized I was no longer looking at the bodies of squirrels, rabbits, and deer. The tortured bodies of, were those of men and women stripped bare of 
more than just clothing. My heart skipped as the shower shut off. I turned one last page, and unlike the other drawings, this one portrayed a group of men and women in a ring around a fire. The fire burned high, but not high enough to hide the figure behind it. On the far side of the fire, an immense creature tall as trees hunched over its bony body. It leaned on its arms, which were twice as big as its torso. Long strands of hair hung over its head. Because of the hair, I couldn't see the creature's eyes, but I could see a pair of lips that stretched across the entirety of its face. Despite its hideous appearance, no one in the ring looked at the creature. Instead, they bowed their heads in reverence. I stared at the picture as long as I could, but time was limited. I closed the book and settled into my bed just in time for Harry to return. Falling asleep was extra hard that night. A normal child might have told Harry's parents or called his own parents to get them the hell out of there, but I couldn't do it. Not, not yet. I needed to see what was in the woods. The next day, I followed the unspoken schedule. By now, I memorized the path to and from the lake. But Harry guided me out of there, out of habit. As soon as my feet touched the sand, he stopped to speak. Uh, let me guess. Wait here? For the first time, a smile appeared on his lips. He hesitated for a moment, and then entered the forest without a word. He knew I'd wait there for him as always. But instead, I would followed Harry just far enough to see him without being seen myself. We trekked through the woods for ten minutes. Our path was fairly linear, but many other paths branched off from ours, perhaps leading to other homes? I stepped lightly and avoided sticks and leaves when I could. Not once did Harry suspect I was following him. Then, after ten minutes, the trail veered right and Harry disappeared from sight. As I neared the sudden turn, I could see the trail exited into a wide glade. Inside the clearing, a fire crackled and voices chanted in the guttural language Harry muttered in his sleep. Aside from the chanting, I heard a woman cry. What are you doing? Let me go! Let me go! Please! I approached the glade as I, as close as I dared. Through the breaks in the trees, I saw a ring of men and women in front of a bonfire. Harry had joined the end of the ring and was chanting along with the others. Across from him, a naked woman stood chained to a post. She continued to cry and beg. Then, among the choir of voices, rose another voice, loud enough and deep enough to drown out the others. Heavy footsteps shook the earth like a rhythmic thud, commanding the beat of the chanting. I heard the crack of wood splitting, and then the chanting stopped. The woman's screams roared through the forest. She could no longer form words, only screams and short, choking sobs. From between the trees, I spied the pale, bony leg of a gargantuan creature. The eyes, my eyes widened as I followed its leg to the rest of its naked, hairless body. Just in the picture, the creature leaned on its arms, which were as long and thick as tree trunks. Over its chest, the white skin stretched so taut I thought it might burst. Yet, despite all its horror, I could not resist the urge to see more. And most of all, I wanted to see its face. I craned my neck for a better look, but the canopy of leaves blocked my view. I could only see the creature's chin some 15 feet up. I looked back down at the chanting group members. Knives had appeared in their hands, including Harry's. One by one, they sliced off a piece of the woman. As the woman's screams soared, the creature behind the fire purred with delight. Jesus Christ, I said to myself. I screwed my eyes shut and I tried desperately to shake myself from this nightmare. It's just a dream. It's just a dream. It's just a dream. <laughs> when I opened my eyes, the woman's cries had stopped. Her head drooped down on her chest. She still appeared alive, but had lost too much blood. By now, she could only shake her head from side to side. I glanced around at the group. They turned almost as one and looked at my direction. Harry met my eyes. For once, his steely gaze broke. His brows pulled together in a fraught look. He mouthed the words, Run. But before I did, the creature bent low to catch me in its eyes. 
As its face neared the fire, a light shone across its ashen face, and I saw the creature did not... It didn't have eyes. Where the eyes should have been, there was only smoothed over skin. The creature's lips parted into a razor-toothed smile that spanned from ear to ear. Then the creature spoke to me. Its thick, guttural words penetrated my mind as, as, it, as it did my ears. Although I didn't know the ancient language it spoke, somehow I understood the creature perfectly. Am I you make our umikras de That is, I am Akar the Small, Deacon of the Dead, Rule of the Eternal. Worship me. When I didn't move or answer, Makar cocked his head so far to the side, I thought he might snap his neck. Thin, black strands of hair dangled around the harsh curve of its face. Then the creature opened its mouth and bellowed into the trees. The great roar shook the forest and nearly knocked me over. Harry covered his ears from the terrible noise and continued to mouth the word, Run! He didn't need to tell me again. I darted along many of the forest paths. Footsteps plodded behind me, but I wouldn't look. Screams and shouts called after me, but I wouldn't look. Highest among the shouts was Harry's. Wait! He yelled. Wait! When he was not talking to me, he was talking to the others. Without stop, I, I, I sprinted to the beach and then to Harry's home. All the while, I prayed to the cra that the praised cult would not appear from a side path. Surely there was a quicker way to get from the glade to Harry's house. Any one of them could have found that path. Somewhere along the way, I'd lost Harry and the others, but still it didn't stop me from running as fast as I could. When I made it home, I burst through the back door. Harry, uh, you're a bit early. Dinner, dinner isn't ready. Uh, where's Harry? Uncle asked. Tears streamed down my face as I told them what I saw. They thought it was a joke or a game, but when I didn't back down from the tail, they agreed that I must be sick. Auntie felt my forehead and decided that I had a fever. She called my parents, apologizing for disturbing their week of a loan, and then asked them to come pick me up. They would be there in an hour. So what happened to Harry? Uncle asked. I didn't know. We sat down for dinner. Any second, we thought, Harry would come through the door, but he never did. We finished dinner. Not long after, my, my parents arrived. Harry still hadn't come home. My parents agreed to help Auntie and Uncle look for Harry, but I gripped their legs and I told them not to go into the forest. I was in hysterics. Finally, my, my parents rushed me home. As it turned out, I did have a fever, and quite a strong one. My parents forced me to take an ice bath and a Motrin, and then go to sleep with a damp washcloth over my head. Regardless, the fever lasted well into tomorrow, and in the morning, my parents said that I spent the whole night m muttering gibberish in my sleep. As for Harry, the police were called. Gave them my story. I told them just how to reach the glade. Then they found the glade, and, and there was nothing there, not even the remains of a fire. To this day, Harry is still missing. My parents sent me to therapy in hopes that I would lose the crazy story and tell the truth. It didn't work, so we didn't talk about that week anymore. We all tried to forget about it. In fact, this is the first time that I've talked about it in years. For a while, I, I forgot about Harry and make Car the Small. I found a steady job and bought a cramped apartment and met a beautiful girl. She stayed at my place the other night. Her presence put me at such a peace that I fell asleep in an instant. But when she woke me up in the morning, she said, You were speaking in tongues, she said, and your smile, your wide, wide smile.